Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. The Adif State Government has accused Philip Shaibu of impersonating the Deputy Governor, despite a recent court ruling that reinstated him. The court's decision, which declared Shaibu's impeachment illegal, is currently under appeal. Adif State Commissioner for Communication and Orientation, Chris Nehikari, stated that Shaibu should not be recognized as the Deputy Governor and any official correspondence from him should be considered fraudulent. The Edo State Government and the Edo House of Assembly have filed for a stay of execution of a court's ruling and are seeking orders to prevent Shaibu from acting as Deputy Governor until the appeal is resolved. The status quo remains that Omobayo Marvelous Godwin is the official Deputy Governor of Edo State and security agencies have been advised to monitor and address any potential breaches of peace related to Shaibu's actions. Now joining us to discuss this is Elvis Asia, is a legal practitioner from Edo State. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on the program. Yeah. All right, so just give, just bring us up to speed with what is happening in Edo State right now. We know that Shaibu has been reinstated as the deputy governor, but there seemed to be a clash because we have one that was installed when Shaibu was well impeached, but now that is back, what is happening? Just take us up to speed. Well, uh, last month, uh, the Federal High Court uh, declared the impeachment of Fili Shaibu as uh, constitutional. And, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, said that that judgment, you know, was well found in law. Uh, but immediately after the judgment, the industry government, uh, industry House of Assembly, filed an application uh, seeking to stay the execution of the judgment. And uh, they also, uh, of course, uh, f uh, before that, filed a notice of appeal. Uh, now, the convention generally uh, in, in legal practice is that when that happens, once you have filed this, uh, an appeal, uh, an application for stay, uh, it is expected that the court will not enforce uh, that judgment until uh, that application for stay is considered. Now, uh, but there's other considerations, you know, in law. You look at what are the nature of the judgment in, in the instant case, being a declaratory judgment. Uh, first, let me mention that uh, a mere, the, mere, the mere filing of the application for state of execution does not amount to a state of execution. Uh, it's because there are very special circumstances the court will consider uh, before uh, determining whether to grant that application or not. So it's something you have to uh, prove, you have to establish. There are some facts you have to establish to be entitled to a state. So the application alone does not amount to a state. But conventionally, the court will not take steps to assist you to enforce the judgment until that application is considered and, and that is that makes sense because uh, look at it if you have gotten a judgment and somebody is, has filed an application for stay if the court goes ahead to enforce enforce it what what that happens after hearing the application for stay then are you going to bring back the person so it's um it, that is appears that's a convention and that convention makes sense but like i said you know a declarative judgment on the other hand mainly just say look this is what the law is uh, this is right, this is wrong, as it was declared in the case of Shaibu. And so, in the eyes of the law, uh, Shaibu, you know, is deputy court. But, like I said, the, the court is not going to lend its aid to the enforcement of the judgment until um, um, the application that was filed by uh, the state government uh, is considered. Uh, but, you know, in, 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 for, for considering the fact that the judgment itself is declaratory, it's really not a judgment that you need the uh, uh, sheriffs or courts, or that you need the police to go and enforce. It's, it's, a, it's a judgment that declares the correct position of the Constitution with regards to the impeachment of a deputy governor. And so that, judge, that judgment is, in my view, uh, automatic in terms, I mean, there's nothing to enforce. It's, it's automatic. It's it just declared the state of the law. And so, you know, uh, whether or not the application for stay that has been filed now can prevent the uh, the Philip uh, Shaibu from saying he's deputy governor. It's something that um, is subject to debate. Uh, yes, you know, uh, being able to exercise the powers of the deputy governor on the basis of the judgment can be an issue because, of course, you know that constitutionally the deputy governor is really more like an appendage to the deputy to the governor. Uh, it doesn't really have a constitutional role. It's what the governor tells you to do that you do as deputy governor. And it's going to be difficult for you to go to the office, you know, 
uh, do anything uh, that attaches to your office. But in the eyes of the law, uh, in my view, uh, he remains deputy governor. Okay, but well, uh, let's look at, now it's almost like it's neither here or there, but because, mm -hmm. uh, yes, you say in the eyes of the law he's the deputy governor, but uh, practically he may not be the deputy governor because the governor is making a pronouncement that he's, he's now, he's not just a usurper, he's in, is uh, impersonating yeah. the actual deputy governor. How would you how would you assess the statement of the governor in view of the fact that a judgment has been given, no matter whether, like you said, whether there's been a an application for stay of action or not? Well, uh, I, I don't I don't I don't know whether it is correct to say it's impersonating. I think uh, the facts would determine whether or not it's impersonating. Uh, it's, the, you know, the Edozi government has merely alleged that. I don't know whether he has signed documents, whether he has sought to use money or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, saying that he's impersonating something that is subject to uh, proof. Uh, but like I said, I don't see anything in law that stops him from saying he's deputy governor, which is what he has said. Uh, he, you know, so, but if he now, uh, like, I said, like I said, until the application that was filed by the Edozi government is determined, practically, you know, giving the effect to the judgment will be an issue for him. He can't practically enforce it. But, you know, I don't see anything that he has done that that should be interpreted to me. Uh, he has flouted the law in terms of uh, merely saying that he's deputy governor. And he's in the eyes of the law, he's deputy governor. It's been declared by the court. It's a declaration. It's not something that you want to go use belief for the police to go and enforce. It's a declaration of right. As it stands today, that has been declared. So, so but, but when when he was removed, when he was removed, his security details were taken away from him. I'm sure his salary was stopped and all that. At this point, he is entitled to, by your uh, assessment, he's entitled to having all his security details yeah. again and his entitlements as, dep as deputy governor. Is that it? Because it seems like the game here is let's delay the judgment until after election, which is coming up in I think November or so. So it's just a few months away from from in fact, today. You have just taken you have just taken the, the word out of my mouth. What this is mere political um, power play mm. uh, because you know he has moved to the APC and there's fear that if he is allowed to function as deputy governor, obviously uh, there's there's some political advantage that I might uh, give to. The APC, and I believe that is what uh, the governor and you know the Dose government is trying to prevent. Um, I feel the post of the deputy governor legally, not not uh, because I, I we, we, nobody really supports any, any of them, but I feel that his post legally because what they are trying to do right now is that we use this application to tie down uh, the matter until the expiration of this tenure. And from the experience we have had with other deputy governors, usually the succeeding government that will eventually pay uh, is uh, dual allowances and salaries and, and all of that. It's going to be very difficult for the governor to allow him to enjoy those benefits because it's more like an ego thing. You know, the governor feels defeated, will feel defeated, and he's not going to allow that, uh, which is wrong, actually, because we all should be sub submissive and subject to the law and not to our personal egos personal idiosyncrasies which we see uh, manifesting in those states. Uh, so you are right that it's going to be very difficult for him to have access to all of those the security, um, uh, the, the salaries and other benefits that accrues to the office, uh, perhaps until the application is determined. This also brings to, uh, to the fore the challenges we are having with the judiciary. Uh, for an application of this nature, one would have thought that you know it, uh, the application would be treated with some urgency. Uh, it's, it's going to a month now since that application was filed. Today is 13, I believe it was filed on the 18th or 17th of January. Uh, one would have thought that by now that application would have been considered in interest in the, in the, in the, in the, in the interest of uh, not just in the interest of justice, but in the interest of uh, good, good governance. Of, of I mean, right now we're having issues as to who is deputy governor, who is not deputy governor. So, do you think this at, is a uh, decoy just to also make sure that you know they delay as much as possible till November, even from the justice system as well? Obviously, it's, uh, that's it. Even if the court refuses, even if the court of appeal refuses the application, I can assure you that on the same day, they will file another one at the Supreme Court or uh, wherever, you know, basically just to make sure that he doesn't smear that office uh, until the expiration of the tenure of this administration. That's basically that, that's the goal, and which is why I'm not happy with the judiciary, uh, not with the judge, because, you know, as a lawyer, you feel for the judges, 
given the kind of system by which you are operating to too many cases uh, and the fact that you have fewer judges and in these cases a judge will have 50 cases on a day so how do you expect a quick dispensation of justice under that kind of system because this kind of case one would have thought that you know it would be easily be dispensed with in order to ensure that uh, you know both parties uh, you know rights are settled uh, way before uh, you, you cannot keep people hanging in cases like this but unfortunately we are, we are having that situation and the losing party in, in most litigations always hang on that and which is what the uh, state government is hanging on and it is uh, it is not uh, it is not right because particularly when the courts have declared an action unconstitutional that is a serious issue um you know and it's expected that to be treated with dispatch and that application is considered whether or not the court wants to grant it but if, I, I know that it's going to be very difficult for a court to grant an application for state of execution but you know it's, it's, it's been filed but you know uh, so it should be determined quickly so that Felicia uh, Ibu would um, uh, perhaps get some benefit of whatever is left of the channel but you know politically they want to make sure that he doesn't get it and they're going to continue to file applications uh, and, and until the end of this admi administration well, that, that brings to the question the, the judicial system and the challenges therein, because you just mentioned, how can a judge have 50 cases? Uh, yeah. Even 20 cases is a, is a big a thing in a day. It's, it shouldn't be. What, what are the bottlenecks that are militating against having more judges in Nigeria? Let's digress a little bit to that. Because the, 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 the truth of the matter is that I'll tell you, I'll tell you and uh, I want to be clear, cool. the judiciary as we have it today is a joke. Really, it's not really interested in any justice. It cannot serve the purpose of justice. It cannot fix the challenges that people are facing. And so what you have in court today is basically people fighting over whether, whether or not the court has jurisdiction. Federal court, uh, is it the federal court that has jurisdiction? Is it the state? There are so many cases. And, you know, a judge on a day who has, like I said, 40, 50 cases. And why do you have that? What, are you, what, what really can you do? How many cases are you going to be able to handle properly? And so when uh, uh, one of the, the lawyers wants to frustrate the process, uh, asks for an adjournment, files an application on the eve of the case, it's difficult for the court judge to investigate it because at the end of the day, the judge is even uh, tired already of all the cases that you have. And so the judicial system that we have, the legal framework establishing the judicial system as we have today is a complete failure and it requires a holistic uh, revamping. You need to redo the system. It doesn't serve the purpose of justice at all. You have uh, we have cases at uh, the Court of Appeal, Federal Court, wherever, for years. I have a fundamental application that I filed in 2018, and it's still pending at the Federal High Court. That is that is that is a shame because fundamental high cases are supposed to be treated with dispatch. In fact, it's supposed to be an urgent matter for the court, you know, based on the Constitution and the relevant rules that guide it. But today we we are, we are, we are 2019. This is 24, 2024. I mean, how, how can you... How, so the system is structured to fail. And right now, and we have to tell ourselves the truth, as lawyers, as judges, as uh, government, you know, uh, those in government who really wish to uh, uh, fix the system, that the system is not just a failure, but it's a joke. People go to court to joke today, not to do justice or to... And the system, as it stands now, cannot guarantee any justice. And this is not the fault of any judge. This is not the fault of uh, any judge, like I said. It is the fault of the legal framework that enables so many frivolities in the name of litigation, that enables so many uh, unnecessary adjournments of cases. How can a judge be talking about the hearing application for extension of time? It is, it is a shame that in the, in the 21st century, a judge will be hearing application for extension of time. A party files an application out of time. I mean, the, the rule says you should pay default fees and all of that. The rule should end at that. Once the default fee is paid and the registrar of a court satisfied that has been paid, that should be a law. Because yes, we, we, we see all these challenges. We see all these channel challenges. But why are there no sufficient judges? Is it because lawyers are not uh, are not there to be made judges, or is the criteria is too high, or what is it? Why do we have such few judges to take on fifty really, cases per day? It doesn't make the, sense. The reason is very simple. Government does not prioritize justice. Government has not really given justice a priority. You see, when you prioritize anything you prioritize, you have the funds, you have the time, you have the resources to support. Yeah. 
You know, what they will tell you is that you don't have resources, you have dilapidated structure. The Federal High Court in Lagos, for example, uh, you know, they started building it since around 20, 20, 2009 or 2010. It's still under construction. Uh, you know, people, who, if you go to any time I go to Federal High, Federal High Court, I will have BP throughout the night. Because you, in most cases, you are going to stand outside or you are going to sit in some um, place that looks like a place where you go and train goats and sheep for a Federal High Court in Lagos. You know, so at the end of the day, the problem is that government has not prioritized justice. Justice is central to everything we do. It is what it is what separates us from the state of nature. You know, uh, you know. So it is what it is what separates us from animals. But right now, it's more like uh, an animal, animal kingdom because if you really want to ensure that there's uh, modernity, there's justice, there's civilization, justice is key. Justice in us, in, in our ramification. We haven't paid more attention to it. We haven't put in the, 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 the required resources, the required funding. And even the way manner we appoint judges does not serve the purpose of justice because you see that there's a lot of opportunism, there's a lot of uh, cronyism, there's a lot of political, politically induced appointments. And, and that, all of this uh, has you know, combined to frustrate the system. So until we decide to prioritize justice, until we come to terms with the fact that justice is more than just uh, delivering judgment, it permeates the entire system. It is what lubricates the system. You know, how can businesses grow? You have a business, for example, and actually it's five, five years you are still in court. The goods at the port, a, goods, a, a ship is, uh, uh, you know, there's a ship at the, at the port that is, that is dead, that's been dead, that would, that would have everything on the ship will, will be damaged because you have a case in court. Until you have, until you practice justice, nothing's going to be done. This is not only really about whether or not there are lawyers who, there are good lawyers who want to be judges, um, you know, but the, the, the system is not, you have uh, some sort of ceiling on the number of judges that, uh, that will, can be appointed. And so that's because the, the, the government will say there's no, they don't have the form. And then the infrastructure is not there. You don't have much judicial independence. Because after all, people, for access to justice, people pay. So what would have thought that all of these monies that we are collecting uh, from litigants will put it together and uh, use it to ensure that you have a proper, your, a proper working system? As it stands now, uh, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a joke. Government has to prioritize justice. We have, all of us we must come to turn to the fact that it is the center of any civilized society. But right now, I don't think we, we, love, we love civilization. We just, we just want to wallow in this mess that we call mm. uh, a, a, a judiciary and, 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 and then take the benefit of it. Because imagine our politicians are taking advantage. Bad people who want to game the system are taking advantage because they can easily file applications to stop proceedings. Some lawyers in the, in the system, for example, who you say are good lawyers, uh, the, the only thing they do is, is, is to game the system. So it's a systemic problem. So until you re remove that system, until you remove that system and ensure that everybody focuses on fairness, justice, ensuring that there's expeditious disposal of cases, ensuring that those who come to court are treated with some uh, respect, it, they're not just there because otherwise people will sort of, uh, of self-help. Today what we have is that Rather than going to court, people are going to the police to arrest people for civil cases because, you know, they, they feel that that would be faster. You can't yeah. continue to have a system like that. Mm. I think the, the, the justice system definitely needs, like, the uh, overhaul pretty much because I know that there was even something yeah. that was filed, but the court had thrown out um, the application to bar Nigerians from the hunger protests, mm -hmm. in fact. So sometimes you just wonder what's going on, what are the judges doing, what kind of judgments are they you know, pronouncing. Um, there just needs to be an overhaul in that. But I want to um, go back to Edo State and Shaibu. You had mentioned that um, he had been moved, he had gone to APC. Of course, you know that Edo State is kind of like being ruled by, in fact, the Niger Delta as a whole is really being ruled by the PDP. So do you, do you think that there is, you know, this whole party thing there's a party play to it as well with all of this that's happening in those states of course i i want to believe there's some party play um if you look at the campaign that's been going on in those politics mm. you will see that uh, strangely the apc has picked a candidate that cannot even speak for himself that cannot come online on, on air for example mm. to explain his programs it, it will seem that they are relying on perhaps uh, the uh, federal rights in quotes um, and so even this Philly Shaibu's uh, recent um, um, attempt may also, uh, you know, I mean, you can't take it away uh, politically. But the good thing today is that in you know, those states uh, going into this election, 
uh, there is a possibility that you know they will, they, 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 whether PDP or APC will be off stage. We we have a uh, very viable candidate in other political parties like the Labour Party uh, that, that, that is also going to challenge them. Uh, so uh, we, we hope that uh, you know this politics of uh, I mean everything is politicized. A simple thing as a judgment of a court has now been politicized. A judgment of a court that declares. An action clearly or constitutional is being politicized, and so you now need to you now need the political mind that you can maybe you get from APC to assert yourself, which is what I think is happening with uh, Philip Shai. And then the governor, on the other hand, is using his own power as governor, uh, uh, like he has uh, like he has done in the last couple of years, uh, to muzzle up the system. You know, arrogate everything to himself. It's, it's not it's not it's not the right thing. Um, you know, it's not the right thing. So we. We uh, in those states, um, I, I just hope that the people will look at all of this and uh, you know comment by by the, through their votes. Mm. Hmm. Oh well, Philip Shaivo, mm. <laughs> I don't I don't know how that is. I mean, with our political system, there's just a lot happening. You know, River State has their own um, squabbles that they are going through. We have a do state as well. I just hope that at the end of the day, most of our politicians will understand that everything they do should be for the interest of Nigerians, not just for their own personal interest or ambition, because what is happening in the state are um, egos clashing, two different people, that's how it started, um, and now you're seeing it move over, even now we're talking about the justice system, it, is, it has a ripple effect on, on a lot of things in Nigeria, mm. which is quite unfortunate. So that's how one action can start to change, you know, can have a course of reactions even in other areas. And I hope that they understand what they are doing and make sure that Nigerians, the, the interests of Nigerians should be at the forefront of every single action that they take. Anyway, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment right now. Thank you so much, Elvis, for joining us and sharing your valuable contributions. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the program. Yeah. Right. All right, we've been speaking with Elvis Asia, as a legal practitioner, joining us from Edo State. And we've just been talking about what is going on in Edo State. The Edo State government has said that Philip Schwebo was impersonating the deputy governor. We'll go on a short break now. When we return, we'll be looking at our next hot topic, which talks about bombing of APP secretariat, a threat to democracy, according to IPAC. Please stay with us. <laughs> 